What the fuck is up? Welcome back. My name is Noah Hills. You can find me on Twitter at no More Parties. In today's video, I'm going to talk about the guy who is the most overvalued player, overdrafted player in rookie drafts right now. He's going at the 102. It's Kenneth Walker. Let's get into it. <laughs> Uh, before the draft, Kenneth Walker was my RB2 in this class. He's an elite pure runner. I gave him a Julius Jones comp. Like, he's a he's a slightly undersized dude at 211 pounds. Um, he doesn't catch a lot of passes. You know, we didn't see that from him in college. Um, but I think he's just big enough to get, like, high-volume work and be a good, productive, efficient two-down runner in the NFL. After the draft, you know, he went with the 41st pick to Seattle um, in the second round. That's good capital in a seemingly pretty good situation. Like, that's a run-heavy offense. Um, Rashad Penny is the main guy there right now. Pretty fragile competition there. Like, Rashad Penny's struggled to stay healthy for his career. The other, you know, good running back in that offense is Chris Carson, who, you know, we have no idea if he's healthy or not. And that kind of draft capital, like early, mid, second round, suggests a lead role for really any running back. And so that seems good. But I think it's it's a little bit worse than it looks as far as like the situational factors for Kenneth Walker in Seattle. And the first reason is that, you know, number one, Rashad Penny is legitimate competition. I think Rashad Penny has this kind of reputation. He's almost like a joke at this point. He was picked in the first round with Seattle back in, what, 2018. Never really kind of actually secured that lead role. He's been hurt a lot, like consistently throughout his career he's been hurt. So he has this reputation as like a bust, a bad player. But you know, while he might be a bust given that he just hasn't been available, he is a good player. He's been efficient on the ground on a per-touch basis in every healthy stretch of his career. And especially last season, you know, the you know that final stretch, five or six games at the end of last year, his team relative numbers, he averaged two yards per carry greater than the other running backs in the Seattle offense last season, which is in the 97th percentile. And if you adjust his, you know, efficiency numbers, given the box counts that he was seeing, the average carry for Rashad Penny was worth 100 72% of the output of, you know, the average carry for other Seattle running backs last season. That's a box adjusted efficiency rating in the 99th percentile. Like you could make a, a le pretty legitimate case that Rashad Penny was the best pure runner on a per touch basis last season. He was running at a 2000 yard pace over a 17 game sample based on the 706 yards he had in the final six games of 2021. He was healthy during that stretch. He's healthy right now. Um, there's no reason to think that he's not healthy going into the season. Like, yes, he's been healthy and disappointing throughout his career, but when healthy, he's been really good on a per-touch basis. He was elite on a per-touch basis last season, and he's currently healthy. Like, he's legitimate competition at the top of a depth chart for a guy like Kenneth Walker. And the second reason why I think this spot isn't necessarily as good as it might seem for Kenneth Walker is that draft capital doesn't mean as much in Seattle as it would like nearly anywhere else. Like I said before, the last time Seattle spent big capital on a running back, like early in the draft, that was Rashad Penny, and Rashad Penny sat the bench behind a seventh round pick in his rookie season. In the first two games of 2018, Seattle gave kind of Rashad Penny a shot at a 50-50 split, really, with Chris Carson. Rashad Penny had 38 yards on 17 carries in the first two games of his rookie year. Meanwhile, in the same two games, Chris Carson had 75 yards on 13 carries. And so Chris Carson, on a very small sample for both of these guys, was more efficient in the, in the first two games. And after that, Carson had 32 carries for 102 yards the following week. Penny went three for five in that game. And then over the rest of the season, Chris Carson had 1,076 rushing yards, played at a 1,500 rushing yard pace over the course of the rest of the season, while Penny had 5.8 carries per game the rest of the season. So like Penny got two weeks to prove that he was better than Chris Carson. He had a hard time acclimating to the NFL in those two weeks. So they yanked him, put his ass on the bench. And Chris Carson, a seventh round pick who was hurt pretty much the entire year before, came in and was just like the lead back and played well. The point here is not that like Penny was bad and lost the job. Like if we're looking at, you know, whether or not he's good or bad and it takes like two weeks to prove that, that's that's a tough sample to say that any rookie is going to be good. And we've seen since Penny be like super dynamic when healthy. Again, like going back to back to last season, he was one of the best running backs on a per touch basis as the lead back at the end of the year. Throughout his career, he's been similarly efficient when healthy, really good relative to what other guys in the Seattle offense are doing. He's been a dynamic runner every time he's been healthy. The point is not that Penny was bad and lost the job. Carson was also legit. And so this wasn't like, ah, Penny sucks. We're just going to give the job to anybody. Like Penny has been good. Carson was just also really good that year. The point is A, 
The leash was really short with Rashad Penny. They took him in the first round, gave him two weeks to prove that he was better than Chris Carson and whoever else they had in the backfield, and then put him on the bench when he failed to do that. So that's that's the first part of the point. And B, this is a meritocracy. Seattle has essentially the same coaching staff. You know, they've, they've churned through offensive coordinators, but like Pete Carroll's the same here. Typically, first round capital, second round capital for a running back is like, okay, this guy is the presumed starter. He's going to get touches. He's going to be the lead back. In Seattle, that seems to not be the case. They're letting the best players play, Rashad Penny was worse than Chris Carson through a couple weeks in his rookie season, so Chris Carson was the starter. Like, they they don't give a fuck that Rashad Penny was a first-round pick and Chris Carson was a seventh-round pick. They're playing the guys who play better. They're totally fine with that. And in the post-draft press conference um, just a couple days ago, Pete Carroll was talking about the Kenneth Walker selection, said that they, they like using multiple running backs in order to keep everyone fresh and healthy. They don't know yet what Chris Carson's health looks like. They said that the Kenneth Walker selection was not made with Chris Carson's health in mind because they don't have uh, medicals back for him. It was simply that they viewed Kenneth Walker as the best player for them, the best player on the board at the time that they picked, but they like to use multiple running backs. Like they've seen Chris Carson get hurt. They've seen Rashad Penny get hurt these past couple years. And I think they see that and want to use a split backfield. They want to rotate guys in and out to keep everybody fresh, keep everybody healthy. And Pete Carroll also said that he's just comfortable going with the hot hand. So as they rotate these guys in and out, if Kenneth Walker's playing really well, he's going to get most of the run. If Rashad Penny's playing really well, he's going to get most of the run. If Chris Carson is healthy and he's playing well, he's going to get a lot of the run. They don't necessarily view this as being like, oh, we took we took Kenneth Walker to like replace, you know, Chris Carson and Rashad Penny to be our lead back. They took Kenneth Walker because they thought he was a great player and could fit into this rotation as they, you know, mix in a bunch of guys. And so that kind of begs the question, like, what if Kenneth Walker has this same issue that Rashad Penny had where like a couple weeks into his career, he's slow to acclimate, um, you know, just kind of is getting his footing under him and isn't dominating immediately. Are they going to just not go to Rashad Penny in that case? Like he's established himself as a quality NFL player. I'm not confident that they wouldn't just go to Penny, just like they went to Carson a couple years ago. What if Kenneth Walker is good those first couple weeks, but Penny's simply better? Like he run, rips up a few long runs. He's just better on a per touch basis. He's better as a receiver, maybe. Like Kenneth Walker could be good. What if Rashad Penny's slightly better? Do they not just go to Rashad Penny? Like, I'm not confident in that. What if both of them are good and Kenneth Walker is slightly better? Do they completely go away from Penny and this is just a one-man show with Kenneth Walker? Or, you know, if they're both good, are they going to mix both of them in and out? I'm not confident that it's going to be the Kenneth Walker show in any of those situations. The third point is that Seattle is a terrible spot for Kenneth Walker to realize his, like, hypothetical receiving potential. The argument going into the draft, like, with Kenneth Walker as a prospect, was that he was a good receiver stuck on a team in Michigan State that just didn't throw to their running backs. I don't find that to be a particularly compelling argument. I made a a video about Kenneth Walker a couple weeks ago, pre-draft, kind of going into all of these different arguments about him as a receiver, so check that out if you, you know, kind of feel like I'm glossing over this. But the point is, the, the the best argument for Kenneth Walker as a receiver coming in was that he is hypothetically good there. Michigan State just didn't use him in that way. But the problem with that now in Seattle is that Seattle doesn't throw to their running backs either. In 2021, the target share for Seattle running backs was 14%, which is the fourth lowest number in the entire league. The most receptions for a single Seattle running back since Rashad Penny was drafted in 2018 is 37. And last year, the leader was DJ Dallas, who had 21. And the running backs in Seattle combined in 2021 had 58 receptions. They just don't throw to their running backs either. And so if we're looking for Kenneth Walker to like realize some sort of untapped potential he has as a receiver, and that's going to allow him to like maximize his fantasy usefulness, that's not going to happen in Seattle. The kind of counterpoint I've seen to this is like, but running quarterbacks don't throw to their running backs. Russell Wilson is a running quarterback and he's gone now. So like they shouldn't have that issue any longer. I don't really think that's a legitimate argument either because Russell Wilson can hardly be considered a running quarterback at this point in his career. In 2021, he averaged easily the lowest rushing yards per game of his career. He averaged easily the lowest yards per carry of his career. And he averaged easily the lowest carries per game of his career. And he finished 17th in the league in rushing attempts among quarterbacks. He had fewer per game than Tua Tungavailoa, had fewer per game than Sam Darnold, Justin Herbert, Daniel Jones, both Taylor Heineke and Carson Wentz. Half a carry more per game, just half a carry more per game 
than Baker Mayfield, Jimmy Garoppolo, and Mac Jones. Garoppolo and Mac Jones are absolutely not running quarterbacks. Tua is not really a running quarterback. Like Sam Darnold, Justin Herbert, Daniel Jones, Heineke, like these are guys with mobility who aren't like, this isn't Lamar Jackson here. This isn't, you know, prime Cam Newton. This isn't prime Russell Wilson. This isn't prime Michael Vick, who's just like tunnel vision on scrambling when nobody's open. Like Russell Wilson is not so uniquely prone to just like bailing out of the pocket and running at this point in his career that we should look at his target share numbers to running backs as like, you know, with an asterisk, like, okay, but they had a running quarterback and they don't anymore. Like Russell Wilson is not a running quarterback at this point in his career, at least not relative to other quarterbacks in the league. He's completely average at that point. He's not a particularly good runner as a quarterback and he's not a particularly high volume runner at quarterback. And so the point here is that Seattle doesn't throw to running backs either A, because they don't have great pass catchers at running back. And if that's the case, then why should we expect Walker to be any different? Like there's this hypothetical that like he's probably good, but Michigan State didn't use him. Check out the other video I made because I don't really think that's the case. He was inefficient when he was used. He was inefficient even when you account for his quarterback throwing him, you know, poor targets. Historically uninvolved as a pass catcher, even given the size of his role, like he wasn't maxed out as a rusher. There was still room for him to catch pass. Is like all those arguments, if you're finding what I'm saying, like, no, unbelievable or not convincing, like check out that other video. I think it's, you know, I dive into this a little bit more. And so if, if the case is that they don't have great pass catchers at running back, there's no reason for us to suggest that Kenneth Walker is different in that area than like Chris Carson, Rashad Penny, these other guys. Like Rashad Penny was more of a receiver in college than Kenneth Walker was. Chris Carson was similarly uninvolved as a receiver as Kenneth Walker was, but Chris Carson's role was much smaller in the offense than Kenneth Walker's was. Like, there's a reason he wasn't involved as a receiver, because he wasn't involved overall. Kenneth Walker was the centerpiece of his offense, so I don't find that argument compelling. The other argument for Seattle is that they don't throw to running backs just because they don't throw to running backs. Like, it has nothing to do with the quality of the running backs they have. It has nothing to do with Russell Wilson being a running quarterback. It's just like, that's not part of their offense. And I think this is probably likely. The target share for running backs in Seattle was stable at that 14% mark in the four games with Geno Smith, when Russell Wilson wasn't even playing playing, even though Geno Smith averaged fewer carries per game than Russell Wilson did, he was targeting running backs at the same rate. So it's probably just a function of the offense. This is not because Russell Wilson was a runner, but even if we say that was the reason, Drew Locke is probably going to be the starting quarterback this year. His career carries per game is essentially equal to what Russell Wilson's carries per game was in 2021. He's the same type of runner that we saw Russell Wilson be last year, and the sample of play that we have for Drew Locke is the 14 games that he started in Denver in 2020, where the target share for for Broncos running backs was 12.9%, which is even lower than the 14% that Seattle running backs had last season. And so if the argument is like, okay, Russell Wilson's a running quarterback, he's not there anymore, we should see more targets to the running backs as a result, A, Russell Wilson's not really a running quarterback at this point, B, the times we've seen the Seattle offense without Russell Wilson, they've targeted running backs just as little as they did with Russell Wilson, and the guy coming in to replace Russell Wilson, A, runs just as much as he did last year, and B, targeted his running backs even less often than Russell Wilson did when he was back at Denver as the starter for nearly a whole season in 2020. The odds that Seattle throws to running backs now that Wilson is gone just seem low to me. Like, the, the arguments in favor of that are not compelling, which is a problem for Kenneth Walker in particular, because contributing as a receiver is very important for the fantasy production of undersized running backs. Since 2000, so going back, you know, since the turn of the century, only three guys have posted 15 plus PPR points per game while catching fewer than two passes per game. 15 points per game PPR is right around where like the RB14 has finished in the last five years. So this is like low end RB1 production, high end RB2 production. This is not even elite production. This is just like quality fantasy starter production. Only three guys have posted that while catching fewer than two passes per game and being less than 215 pounds since the year 2000. That's D'Angelo Williams with Carolina, Willie Parker in Pittsburgh, and Elijah Mitchell last season. And there's, you know, some question whether he's actually under 215 pounds. He weighed in at 200 at the Combine. The Elijah Mitchell stands claim that he's actually like 220 pounds. So if we, we, if we believe them, at most three guys, at least two guys in the last 21 years who have been the type of guy that Kenneth Walker is as a slightly undersized running back who probably doesn't contribute as a receiver and probably doesn't have the potential to maximize his potential as a receiver in this offense, who've then gone on to produce like at least low-end RB1s in fantasy. That's not good. Kenneth Walker's size makes him unlikely to receive heavy volume on the ground. Like historical data just says that running backs who are 
of below average size do not get as much volume as bigger guys. Kenneth Walker is slightly undersized at 211 pounds. And if he also doesn't catch passes, the odds that he produces as even a low RB1 are low. Like, how many running back seasons have there been since 2021? Like, thousands. And only three of them have been... RB1 level producers as small guys who don't really catch passes. Uh, that's not really good. And the fourth point for this situation not being as great as it you know, might look given the draft capital, given the run heavy approach by Seattle. The fourth point is that Seattle's just going to be bad and defying history is hard in a bad offense. And, you know, the, the history we have is like this, this 20 year sample of small running backs who don't catch passes, like being good in fantasy. That's difficult to do. If we're going to say like, yeah, Kenneth Walker is the guy to buck that trend. That's difficult to do given how bad Seattle is probably going to be. The negatives and like the things that Kenneth Walker has to overcome are just, they just pile up. Like small guys re need receiving volume to produce. He's unlikely to get that given his receiving profile from college and given how little Seattle throws to running backs. He needs high rushing volume if he doesn't catch passes. And given that Seattle generally seems to not give a fuck about draft capital, it's harder to bank on high volume than it would be in other situations. And there's a guy in Penny who's a quality runner, so it's hard to say like he's just going to put Penny on the bench. Seattle's history and Penny's, you know, efficiency, you know, kind of suggests that this is going to be a split and it's going to be difficult for Kenneth Walker to just like run away with this job. And the other part of this is that Seattle is very low in play volume. They've been below league average in total plays run in both of the last two seasons. And in 2021, they finished last in total plays run. They had 122 less plays than league average and had 52 less plays than the team that finished second lowest in plays run. Like they are just incredibly behind everybody else in pace of play. They're behind everybody else in run pass ratio, which is good for a guy who runs the ball that they're going to run the ball a lot, but it's bad for overall offensive efficiency. And it's bad given that there are lots of running backs in the league, like targets are worth more yards on average than carries are. And so it's harder to like make up for efficiency when such a large percentage of your touches are going to be carries. Like the highest efficiency guys in yards per touch in the league are guys who see lots of targets. Kenneth Walker is going to see you know, maybe lots of carries if he's the lead back in this offense. You just have to thread the needle on a lot of factors in order to be confident in Walker. Like, he has to establish himself immediately in order to not get yanked in case Rashad Penny's just playing better. Um, he has to be incredibly efficient um, and get a lot of volume on the ground, given that Seattle is going to be an inefficient offense who doesn't run a lot of plays. He's probably not going to catch the ball a lot, given that he didn't do it in college and Seattle doesn't throw to their running backs. And we have to see something that it seems Seattle isn't interested in doing in Kenneth Walker just being like the pure lead back, Rashad Penny either needs to get hurt, which is a possibility, but he needs to get hurt or Kenneth Walker just needs to be way better than him in order for Kenneth Walker to be the lead back in this offense. And it's hard to bet on like one or both of those things happening, given what we've seen with how Seattle handles their draft capital in the past and with how good Rashad Penny has been when healthy and how you know, it's more likely that he stays healthy, given that there's another guy in Walker to kind of mix in like Pete Carroll wants to do. Kenneth Walker is currently the 102 in rookie drafts, and I just cannot make the bet that all of these things are going to shake out correctly for him over guys like Garrett Wilson, Drake London, and Traylon Burks, wide receivers with good profiles, really nice draft capital, who ended up in pretty good spots to either be in, in efficient offenses or get a lot of target volume in you know, bad to decent offenses. You don't have to make nearly as many assumptions about things going right for those guys as you do for Kenneth Walker. And because of that, I'm just not interested in Kenneth Walker until the 105, which is still like a pretty premium pick. I might even be convinced to take like Sky Moore over him. You know, Jameson Williams, Chris Olave are in that conversation for me. I'm not saying I'm taking Walker after them, but he's part of that tier to me as opposed to part of a tier with like Brees Hall or even that, that first tier of receivers. He's still my RB2. I I think he's in a tier for me with Damian Pierce and Rashad White. It's not a Brees Hall and Walker tier. It's not a Brees Hall tier and then a Walker tier and then those guys. It's Brees Hall and then the three guys behind him. I think Walker is in a group with those guys. He got good draft capital to a team that runs the ball a lot. I think the situation is a lot worse than it seems and the odds that we see Kenneth Walker fully unleashed to his full potential seem pretty low to me given the situation. I'm staying away at the 102 in rookie drafts.